So Jeremiah 17 picks up in the middle of a lot of prophecies that the prophet Jeremiah was giving in the name of the Lord to his people who were disobeying him and following other gods. <clears throat> and even when God brought judgment upon them in the form of sending other nations to conquer them and to, th or to, and to threaten to conquer them, instead of turning back to God and saying, oh, wow, we've, you know, we messed up. We've been trusting false gods. We've been following the wrong thing. They would, in fact, look to other nations. So if, as if trusting themselves wasn't good enough, they figured they'd also trust other nations like Egypt and places like that. And so they're, they find themselves in this passage in a spot where God has, has given them the opportunity to turn back to him. And, and Jeremiah expresses at the end of this passage what a difference it would make if they would in fact be rooted and growing in God. Be rooted and growing in, and for us in rooted and growing in Christ and how healthy they will be how fruitful they would be how much better it would be um, for them so let me start with verse 1 in Jeremiah 17 we're going to read through like I said earlier verse 10 and see what God is saying to them verse 1 says the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron with the point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altars. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills. O my mountain in the field, I will give you, I will give us plunder your wealth and all your treasures and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you even yourself shall let go of your heritage, which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger, which shall burn forever. We'll stop right there just for a second and tell you what Jeremiah, what God is saying to them through Jeremiah. When he says in verse 2, their children remember their, their altars and their wooden images by the green trees and the high hills. It's talking about the places where they worshiped false gods. God had given them everything they needed, every, every kind of powerful work, every kind of provision, every kind of proof of his promises so that they could know him and trust him and worship him and serve him and enjoy him to the nth degree. But instead, they said, well, these other places have these other gods and they claim to do some neat things, and if we do, if we serve them, they say that we'll get these uh, special gifts from them, and all kinds of weird and selfish and sinful ways. And so they, God's saying, "That's where you are. That's what you're doing." And then He goes on to say in verse five, and this is the crux of our message tonight. Thus says the Lord: Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord or whose hope is the Lord for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So what God is saying there is he wants there to be fruit from our lives that is good for us, that is good for others, and that brings him glory, that points people to how good he is. And the way that that fruit 
comes to bear in our lives depends greatly, or you should say the extent to which it comes to bear in our lives depends greatly on where and how we're planted and how healthy we are as his people. So that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes tonight. And I want to ask you to join me in prayer and ask God to <clears throat> help us receive this. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the blessed opportunity to, to know you, um, to depend upon you, to have our hopes in our strength rooted and grounded and nurtured by you. And because of that, we ask tonight that you would help us to in whatever way we need to, to return to depending upon you. That you would help us to see that the, it is the truly only way in which we can be certain that we are being fruitful for you, for your kingdom, for our good, for the good of others when we are depending upon you. Help us with that, I pray. And I pray that you would help us to even depend upon you for your help to depend upon you. See maybe where we're not and yield that to you. And find your strength to help us follow you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to see tonight in just a moment are... Um, Three questions that you can ask yourself to dis to determine whether or not you are spiritually shrubby, spiritually shrubby. Now, I'll explain what that means in a moment, but I want to tell you this um, story that I remi was reminded my reminded myself uh, of this week when I was I'm going to say 22. Um, I needed a car that was reliable and got better gas mileage than what I had. What I had was a rusty old Ford Bronco, um, a 1982, and yes, they, they made cars back in 1982 and did. Uh, I know it's, we were, you know, some people still had horses, but <clears throat> we had cars and we named them after horses like you know, Bronco. Um, so... Uh, and it had a, it was a big old rusty machine that I really liked. It could go anywhere and do anything, and it had a big gas guzzling V8 in it, and it was not what I needed at the time because I had to drive a long way most weeks and needed something else. So, I, one of my I put it up for sale, and one of my neighbors stopped by and offered to make me a trade, straight swap. On of his of his wife's car um, that uh, I don't he, I'm sure he didn't ask her when he offered me that hey, man and uh, so they came by with this car and lo and behold it was a uh, it was a 1984 Honda Prelude now at that point in my life you said Shane if you could have any car um, destroyed off the planet so you never have to drive it what would it be and I would have said a Honda Prelude because they're they look like little whip cars. And um, yet this comes along and guess what? They're known for being dependable. They're known for getting good gas mileage. And I saw God answer my prayers in a, in a way I wasn't expecting. So I, I, I went ahead and made the deal and um, drove that car for, for a pretty good while. When I first moved down here, I was still driving it. And... Yet when I first got it, my main reason, the thing that got me over my disdain for that kind of car was the fact that it was, I knew if nothing else, it was going to be dependable. I could count on it. So that's what I did. And I hadn't had it for two weeks and something, I noticed something really wrong with it. There's no way the guy that had it would have known that before then. So I didn't go up and, you know, bang on his door and ask for my Bronco back. But as I, I, I was driving and I noticed it, so I took it to a shop that I trusted and they told me what was wrong very quickly and I was thankful for that. And then they told me how much it was going to cost and I was not, not thankful for that. Um, and I quickly realized that this dependable car that I was 
depending upon, uh, could also be extremely expensive. And just by the nature of it and the, the, the cost of parts and repairs for it. And so it helped me realize at that point in time and, and, and you realize this week even and being reminded of that, it is typical for us. It's, it's a normal thing for us to depend upon things um, that we need and that we have to have in order to do life like we want to do it. Whether it's your um, vehicle or your oven, microwave, if you're, you know, a guy. Um, so that takes care of, I mean, what do you need an oven when you have a microwave? Or, or we don't really anything if you have a microwave. Um, I once baked a cake in a microwave, not, not even making that up. And it worked, and I ate it. So it's a real thing. <clears throat> and so anyway, we have these things, and we count on these things, and we just do life with these things. And so we we take that and we apply it to ourselves as well and to other people and we start thinking wow you know here in america most things work pretty well we usually can find electricity pretty easily if something breaks we can fix it or or replace it um pretty easily at least you know um, we could more easily you know some time ago but now even still now we can i mean if you have something break electronically you can go on Amazon and have it there before you have time to throw the old one out. And so we depend on the, our stuff and we depend on Amazon and we, it, it kind of, and those things, there's really nothing intrinsically wrong with that unless we're, you know, trusting those things instead of God. But what happens is I think it nurtures in us our nature that, wants to um, depend upon ourselves and depend upon anything else other than God. And that's something common to all of us because we want, in our, our dependence, we find security and we want to find security in ourselves, who we are and what we're doing and what we're able to do. But God reminds us that apart from him, we have nothing. And Jesus said it explicitly when he said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. We need him for everything. And he wants us to, to recognize that need so that we can depend upon him for everything and do like we said a couple weeks ago, rest in him and everything that we're doing and trust in him for everything that we need. And <clears throat> so, um, if, if your faith is only in or primarily in your Honda Prelude or in your microwave or in Amazon, then you have a problem. If your faith is in yourself or in someone else to give you your security or to make you feel fulfilled and provide everything you need, then you really got a problem. Let's read what verse six here and see how God points out that problem and gives us the solution. So I told you we're going to ask three questions about how to find out whether or not you're shrubby. What I mean by spiritually shrubby is going to be pointed out in the verses that we're about to read. So if we look at verse 5 again. It says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall in habit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land which is not inhabited what this is saying is when we trust it put our trust in what we can see who we know what we have how much more we think we can get then we become spiritually shrubby so the first question is have you planted yourself in the wrong place and is that causing you to therefore be shrubby and what I mean by planting yourself in the wrong place is it, it points out in the verses that we just read that that shrub is a shrub because it's in a spot where it can't get anything cannot get enough to 
flourish. Can't get enough nutrients, can't get enough water, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and the same is true for us when, we're, when our faith is rooted in something else. I'm not big on planning stuff. Um, I would like to be, but um, it, it's just that's something I've had time to get into. Um, I did plant some azaleas at our house one time and out of eight of them one survived um and it's still alive so um i feel like that's a pretty good um proportion you know rate whatever so and whereas i'm not really good at it and i know lisa's not here because they're not back yet but um but i can still talk about her probably even better more since she's not here but lisa can kill a plant faster than you can plant one I'm not making it up. So when we were first married, uh, not first, it was right before Marion was born. I had to take a trip to Colorado and I found this cactus while I was taking a walk. So I took the cactus and I put it in a plastic container and put it in my luggage and flew it home. And I gave it to her because I had given her all kinds of flowers and that hadn't worked out well. So I said, well, here's one she can't kill. It'll survive anything. By golly, she killed that cactus. <laughs> And when the cactus die, the cactuses aren't like, you know, the friendliest plants to begin with. But when they die, they're really, you know, when they, when they get start to dry up, they're really, you don't want to touch it. <clears throat> and it made me think about that when I read this verse this week. Because we can get like a shrubby, dried up cactus in our hearts. Remember, this started off with God telling them that the problem that they had was was so deep it was engraved on their hearts it was it ran deep inside of them and they they needed a drastic transformation in order to get it out they needed a spiritual heart transplant and then he goes to use this this illustration this analogy of them in the plants and if you're a, a shrub in the desert you might in fact you probably are still alive otherwise you'd just be a you know pile of twigs <clears throat> but you might be just alive you might be just enough alive to stay alive in other words you almost die and then a few raindrops fall and you're like okay I'll take that and go on. You almost start to think, well, you know, maybe planting myself in the middle of Death Valley wasn't the best idea in the, um, after all. And then you get a little bit of moisture from, the, from a dewy morning and you survive another day. But you know in your heart that you're not thriving as a, as a shrub. And yet you don't want to uproot from where you planted yourself so that the question that we have to answer is have you planted yourself in the wrong place and what that translate to translates to for us as believers in christ is are you depending upon him ultimately and over all things in your life or have you planted your faith in other things have you planted your faith in your health? Have you planted your faith in uh, your wealth, your belongings, <clears throat> your income? Have you planted your faith in your family and, you know, how awesome they are? Have you planted your faith in um, a relationship with uh, whomever? Um, uh, you know, I started showing my kids, which I can't believe them at this point, a video series on dating um, last Sunday night, and um, and even um, even Liam had to watch it, and he's like he's like ah, <laughs> but but it's good for him because you know Liam is being hit up by girls too, so I figured it'd be good for him. <clears throat> he needs to know how to handle that. So um, and I wanted them to I wanted to be able to walk through that with them. Um, you know, and scripturally and with the wisdom of the Lord. Um, 
but the fact is that I told them that a relationship, being in a relationship with someone else can do one of two things. It can either help you draw closer to God and grow deeper in him, um, therefore be more fruitful for him, or it can do the opposite and it can drain you of your spiritual strength. It could draw you away from God unto, unto faith and other things or in, in that person. And God knows that. It's, he knows how we are. And, it, and he, he, what he's saying here is, go ahead and check up for a second and ask yourself, is where I'm planting, planted right now, is where I'm placing my faith right now and putting my dependence right now, is that the best place for me, the best thing for me, the best person for me to place my faith in in order for me to grow? And to be, and to, and to not just survive another day in the desert, um, but to thrive um, where I am, where God, where I'm working, where I'm living, where I'm situated um, in my church, in my family. And if your answer is no, I'm not playing in a good place. It would probably you probably be able to finish that statement by saying I'm not playing in a good place because I'm not fully planted in dependence upon Jesus. And the good news about that is, is that there is a fix for that. It's about recognizing where you are and what your faith is in and um, and saying to yourself, you know what, I look look at yourself in the mirror, look at I look kind of shrubby today. Looking pretty shrubby. Not just because you got a stubby beard like me. But because you realize that you're not planted in God, not depending upon him like he wants you to. And therefore, it's, it's having an impact, taking a toll on your hope, your outlook, your strength, your joy in the Lord. And that's a real thing. And what some of the ways you can tell, just practically speaking, are, you know, if you're a shrub, cactus, for instance, like the one that I gave Lisa, you typically as a cactus you know why they have all those spikes it's to um you know it's it's their self-defense they they shoot them at you if you get no, i'm just kidding that's not what they're in. <clears throat> but they do protect them i mean if you've ever tried to hug a cactus it's not comfortable it is not comfortable the one that i got for lisa when i first saw it i was like oh that's deep <laughs> and grabbed it like a goofball i was like ah! that hurts because it's a cactus it doesn't want you messing with it. It's one of those ways that nature says, leave me alone, stay away. And sometimes we get a little bit cactus-like. We kind of get hard from the inside out and we're like, you know what? I don't want to listen to anybody that's going to, that's going to try to speak truth to me. I don't even want to listen to God who wants to speak truth to me. I don't want to be around people who um, are dependent on something other than what I'm dependent on counting on what I'm counting on. I don't want to change my, I don't want to change my attitude, much less do I want to have my attitude changed by anyone, even God. That's a pretty good sign that we're, that you're getting a little bit shrubby, that you're just getting by spiritually rather than enjoying God helping you to thrive and be fruitful. So let's see what he does with it. So the first question is, have you planted yourself in the wrong place? The second question is, do you feel shrubby? Because it said in, in verse 6, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert. And that's not what God wants for you. What he wants for you is to answer uh, our third question, which is this. <clears throat> do you need to be uprooted and replanted? In Christ so look at the look at verse 7 and 8 with me if you would <clears throat> it says blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit I think this is just like such an amazing p 
picture that God paints for us here about what it looks like to depend on him. First of all, he says here that we're going to be it's we're going to be like a tree planted by the waters and this much I know about plants. They do need water. Um I've learned that by not giving them water and watching them die. Um but so but if you give them if the right amount of water, then they can thrive. Then it says it'll be like a tree planted by the water water which spreads out its roots by the river. In other words, it puts out, you know, trees grow um, down and out in order to reach a greater, greater sources of water, moisture. And the more that, the farther out they reach, the more they grow. So if you see a tree, for instance, and its branches are spread out to a certain point, fact is that underground, where you can't see the tree, the roots are spread out just as far. And we learned at our house that if you cut those roots shorter than the branches, guess what will happen? The branches will die and fall off to the length of the roots underground. And the whole point that I think God is making here and that I'm trying to relay to you is that you can't be you can't grow any more or be any more fruitful than you are rooted deeply in the Lord. We like to think that the way in which we can grow and improve ourselves is by putting on externally, whether it's literally, you know, how we look, how we feel about ourselves, whatever else, or even by just, we do this as, as Christians, unfortunately, by learning the Christian lingo or by trying to put on a good air about ourselves or trying to seem more spiritual than, than somebody else or even than we were, you know, yesterday. Well, what God wants us to do is to put all our eggs in his basket, put, put our roots deeply in him and trust that he is going to help us make us grow. He is going to produce fruit in our lives. It's going to be best for us, best for other others and is going to praise him and help us to praise him and so he says here that because or when that's the case such a tree or such a person will not fear when heat comes now this is interesting because y'all have probably noticed already this year that we've had so little rain this summer that the leaves started changing color in like august like last month and they're already on the ground and it's not even you know, it's just barely the middle of September and that's because they haven't had enough water to help them thrive longer and they're dropping earlier but if a tree has a enough source of water underground then if it's really hot or really dry in the air can it still survive it can. Can it even thrive? It can. Can it still produce fruit? Yep. It's all about what's going on down deep in that tree's life. What's going on down deep in your heart. Whether or not you are saying to yourself and to God every day, God, I need you. God, thank you for being all I need. And when our hearts are having that kind of conversation with God, not that those are some kind of magic words, I'm just telling you that's our what our attitude can be. When that's the case, then you can rest in the fact that God is going to give you what you need, that your roots are in the right place, that he is going to supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus to be who he wants you to be and to live as he wants you to live and to the extent tonight to which you can look at your life and look at your heart and say you know what my heart is is has deceived me a bit and the world has deceived me and Satan has deceived me to to believe that I'm okay 
or I have no choice, or the only option for me is to be hopeless. And granted that we are to, to be hopeless or to have my hope in something else. And granted, we all suffer seasons of drought where things are not, things externally are not what we would like them to be. Amen? Our situations and circumstances aren't just flooding us with goodness so that uh, we're just overwhelmed with all the gifts that life has to give us. That might be the case sometimes, but it's more often the case that that's not the case. <laughs> And so when that is our reality, our faith needs to be in the fact that our roots are deep in the Lord. And regardless of what changes out here in our environment, in our circumstances, if our roots are deep and they're sunk deeply into our source of everything, which is God, we're going to be all right. We're going to be, dare I say, even better than all right. We're not just going to survive. We're going to thrive. It may not, our thriving may not look like what we would like it to look like. It may not change our circumstances one bit. But it will be the ability to live and to keep going, to persevere, because all our hope is in Christ, because our dependence is upon Him. Because we're rooted in him because we know he is our source of all the things that I mentioned here strength hope fruit in the sense of us doing the right things and knowing the right things to do all those things that God promises us are available to us by his gracious faithfulness and our dependence upon him. And what I want you to do tonight is, to, is two things. One, I want you to admit to yourself and to God that you really, 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 ultimately, completely need to depend upon him. And that you really, 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 completely need his help to do so. If there are things in your heart or life that you've been depending upon other than him that you need to tell him about and ask him for help to turn away from or to get help to get rid of, do that. He wants to help you do that. If it's just a matter of you need some encouragement that trusting in God is the right thing to do regardless of what everything else looks like. Ask him for that. Hear what he said to you tonight and know that it is real and true and that it's for you. Each and every one of you. Let's pray and ask him to help it make it so in our hearts and lives. <clears throat> Lord, things can seem pretty dry and desperate in this world sometimes it feels like we are living in the desert whether or not we have planted ourselves there or have, things have just dried up around us I pray that instead of being dried up by both our circumstances and our discouragement that you would help us instead to let our roots spread deeply into you. Let our faith abide deeply in you. Help us to humble ourselves before, before you and desperately depend upon you and see how you would, how you will, how you are even providing for us according to your promises. We ask that you would do so Help us to do so. Help us to, to depend on you. Believing that you are enough. That you have us and everything that we need. And that the result of your help 
helping us to depend upon you and our surrender to that is going to be fruitfulness from the inside out that we are going to be able to know and to do for your good pleasure for our best to reflect your goodness to, the, to those around us and we ask that you would make that the case for each person here tonight and for our church that you would help us to know that all these things that you have said about a tree planted by the water can be true about us a church planted in Essex County and I ask that you would help us to believe that and be fruitful for your glory in Jesus name Amen we're going to 